Oh, hello, and welcome to my channel, Vice- I mean, Santa Rhino here. Today being Christmas Eve, I thought I'd choose a rather festive video to respond to, brought to us from Apologetics Press, the organization known for having a really silly butt. Kyle Butt. But this video isn't from their butt, it's brought to us by Jeff Miller, who serendipitously decided that a festive bright red shirt was the thing to wear for this video, so it fits with my theme. And of course, it being a festive occasion, I naturally gravitated toward a video with a nice wholesome title reminiscent of a holiday that is, according to Christians, all about the love of Jesus. It's called, Is God Unloving for Drowning the World in a Flood? Can't get more festive than genocide, am I right? Okay, I'm done with the voice. Let's go! Using population statistics, taking into account the longer lifespans of the pre-flood period, there were probably at least 215 million people on the planet by the time of the flood. Okay, guys, come on. Can you at least try to get a charismatic speaker sometime? This is the same organization that brought us the guy from my Science vs. Evolution playlist, who I once described as looking like the word moist took human form but hasn't figured out the whole blinking thing yet. What was that guy's name? Oh shit, it's the same guy! I mean, he's older now, but that was Dr. Jeff. I guess someone handed him a towel at some point because he looks much drier now. Still rocking some weird-ass sideburns, though. But... Hey, Dr. Jeff, I'm glad you dried off a bit, but your presentation style is too dry now. Can you at least try to pretend like you want to be there? You seem like you're in danger of falling asleep during your own presentation. All but eight of them were drowned, or worse, during the flood. Uh, can you elaborate on the or worse part of that statement? Like, they died in a worse way than drowning in the flood? I suppose it's possible, but drowning is a pretty painful way to go, so I'm kind of curious what you mean by that. How could God bring such a punishment and still be called loving? He can't. Well, not if we're being honest. Of course, you can still call someone loving who is demonstrably not a loving person, but that just makes the statement incorrect at best and an outright lie at worst. 1 John 4, 7 even says that God is love. How can that be? How can it be loving to kill all those people? Good question. We even get a definition of love given to us by the Bible in 1 Corinthians 13. It is patient, kind, does not envy, does not boast, is not proud, does not dishonor others, is not self-seeking, is not easily angered, keeps no record of wrongs, does not delight in evil things but rejoices with truth, always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. That is the Bible's definition of love. God is love. God always protects. God killed a bunch of people that he supposedly loved, which, according to the Christian worldview, sent most, if not all, of those people directly to hell to be tortured for all eternity. I feel like that's not very good protection. First, we need to understand what the word for love means in the New Testament when describing God. Which is why I got the definition of love directly from the New Testament. Since we use the word love in many different ways in English, it can be confusing to us. In some instances, yes, but we're talking about killing millions of people here. What use of the word love in any language could possibly be applied in this situation? Now, I'm sure he's about to go into all the different words that Greek has for love that represent different types of love that we all refer to with the one word love in English, but why would that matter? Like, let's go over six of the Greek words for love and see if any of them leave room for the genocide of the people that you supposedly feel love for. And while we're doing that, let's ignore my horrible Greek pronunciation, okay? We all agree that I'm not good at saying words sometimes. Philia is a deep friendship type of love. If God had a deep friendship for all the people he killed, would that fit this type of love? I imagine most friends would not appreciate being murdered by their friends, so no. Ludus is a playful love, usually used to describe the playful affection between children. So this might apply if God flooding the world was an accident, he just meant to splash humanity playfully a bit, but it went too far. But something tells me that apologists won't appreciate that view of God. 
And there's pragma, which represents the type of love that is shown in being willing to compromise in order to make a relationship work over the long term, you know, pragmatically, hence pragma. Though for this one, it seems like it was popularized in the 1970s and the ancient Greeks didn't really use it to refer to themselves, so that might not count. But even if it did, it's basically the opposite of what God did. God refused to compromise to make the relationship work, so he overreacted and killed everyone instead. Then there's philaudia. Remember, we're leaving my pronunciation alone, I know it's wrong. Which is self-love, of which there are two subtypes. The narcissistic variety, where you obsess over yourself to an unhealthy degree, and the healthier form where you have a healthy dose of self-esteem. Okay, so the narcissistic version of this one does fit God pretty well, and could definitely account for the Flood. After all, he's so self-obsessed and jealous that he had to kill everyone for not worshipping him and behaving in ways that he didn't approve of. Again, not really the picture of God that Christians generally like, but this one actually does fit the character of God in the Bible. Next comes Eros, erotic love. I don't think this one really fits unless God is into some really, really kinky shit, like the kind of stuff that goes way past the admonition against kink shaming and gets into the if that's your kink you should probably seek professional help territory. And finally we have agape, or unconditional love, where love is not based on behavior or action, it is just freely given. This one definitely doesn't fit because God just straight up killed a bunch of people for behaving wrong, making his love for them conditional on them behaving how he wanted them to behave. So Jeff, which of these words is used in that verse to describe God as love? We're tempted to assume that God being love means that he has warm, affectionate feelings towards us. He really likes us. So are you suggesting that one or more of these words for love do not imply a certain level of affection toward the object of that love? I mean, I guess this could work for the narcissistic self-obsessed one, and that would mean that no, he doesn't have affection toward humanity. So is philaudia the word that's used in 1 John 4, 8? But that's not what the word agape means. The underlying Greek word for love in 1 John 4, 7 is agape. Ah, so unconditional love. God loves us unconditionally, which is why he will torture most of us for all eternity for not having met his conditions. Not to mention the subject of the video, The Flood, where he killed millions for not meeting his conditions. Of all the words for love that ancient Greek has, that is probably the one that most obviously does not fit with the idea of the being who is the living embodiment of this type of love also being the being who drowned the entire population of the planet for not living up to his expectations. It's the most common Greek word for love found in the New Testament occurring over 200 times. It's the underlying word used in Matthew 22, 36 through 40, where Jesus gives the two greatest commands, love God and love one another. Agape is used in both commands. Yeah, so love your neighbor unconditionally. No matter what they do or how badly they behave toward you, you should love them unconditionally. God holds us to a higher standard than he holds himself to. He gets to get angry and jealous when humans don't worship him, or even when they do worship him but do it wrong, and when he gets angry and jealous, he goes into murderous rages where he kills a bunch of people for it. But we humans are expected to be able to have unconditional love for everyone, even those who treat us like garbage. By pulling together the many verses that use agape, we can arrive at its meaning. Well, we don't need to stick to just Bible verses in order to figure out a Greek word. We have lots of ancient Greek writings that can also be used in this endeavor. But sure, go for it. In a word, it means unselfishness. It means giving, not taking. It means having such concern for the well-being of someone else that a person is willing to unselfishly act on that concern no matter who it is and no matter what it costs us. Sure, that's close enough. A sacrificial love where you are willing to give things up that are important to you for the good of those that you love. Usually in Christianity this is then compared to the sacrifice of Jesus. God was willing to give up his own life for us, and also his son, because he and his son are the same person, I guess. I mean, also temporarily, it's not permanent or anything, that would be asking way too much. But that's where this agape conversation usually goes. In this video, though, we're talking about the time when God genocided the entire earth. What did God give up for those people that he killed who he supposedly loved? What kind of a sacrifice was that? 
was that supposed to have been a this will hurt me more than it hurts you moment where, yeah, he killed them all, but he really didn't want to. He just had no other choice. That's the only angle where I could see this working, and it only works if God is not omnipotent, and if he didn't then send all these people to hell. That idea sums up the essence of who God is and what he expects of man. God is so unselfish, he is so loving, that he gave his only son to help man not to perish, John 3.16. Oh, sure, fine, whatever. I mean, that's got a whole other bunch of issues that go along with it, but let's hypothetically accept that for now. How does that help the people that he killed in the flood a couple thousand years before he sent his son? Now, how is executing humans loving? Good question. The answer is to understand that agape is always shown through action, not just feelings and not just words, 1 John 3.18. Yeah, I know that. So how is the action of almost total genocide supposed to be showing unconditional love for the people that were killed? One action that should spring forth from someone with agape love is justice or fairness. Imagine being a 12-year-old. You saved up every penny and bought a new Kindle tablet to read books on. But your older 15-year-old brother, who regularly squanders all of his money, wants your tablet. So, being much bigger, he demands the Kindle from you, punches you in the face when you won't give it to him, and takes it away. You can't do anything about it. Your parents know what happened, but they don't do anything about it. Your brother gets to keep the Kindle, and within a few days has already broken it. Okay, question. Was that fair? Nope, not fair. But in order for this analogy to work, the solution would have to be that the parents step in and murder both of those kids while sparing a third kid so that he could act as their replacement. And actually, it would be worse than that because in your worldview, the victims of the Flood all went to hell. So it's not just killing the kids, but torturing them mercilessly. Should something have been done about that? Isn't that only right? Were your parents being loving to you? How would agape, unselfish concern for and action on your behalf, play out in that situation? Well, as a parent that feels agape love for all of my children, I would penalize the one who did the stealing and comfort the one who was stolen from. I would make it a teachable moment, explain to the one who stole it why stealing is wrong, and let them know that I have higher expectations of them than to be that kind of person, allowing them a chance to redeem themselves in the future. Notably, this redemption would be focused on making things right between them and their sibling, not apologizing to me so that I can forgive them whether the sibling forgives them or not. If a parent implemented no punishment, he wouldn't be a just, fair judge, and he wouldn't be a loving parent to you. And if a parent implemented execution as the punishment, that would also not be fair or just, and would most definitely not be loving. And he wouldn't be loving to the rest of your siblings, since by not punishing your brother, the parent would be encouraging other siblings to, to be wicked as well, which will lead to their ruin later. And what message do you think it would send to the siblings if they saw me overreact and start to torture the kid who was being wicked? Do you think that that would be the basis of a good, healthy, loving relationship? If yes, then stay the fuck away from my family and please go see a therapist. If not, then why is it okay for God? Is morality relative to you where it's okay for one person in one situation but not okay for another? Punishing wickedness is the fair thing to do, and it's the loving thing to do. Only if the punishment is proportional to the crime and is used as a teachable moment to help them improve in the future. And even that only goes up to a certain point. For instance, I am against the death penalty, even though that would be proportional to the crime of murder. And I know the apologetic here is that to fail to properly worship God is a crime against an infinite being, and thus is an infinite crime, and so deserves an infinite punishment. But that's just silly. If God exists and really is an infinite being, then failing to worship him is a crime that cannot possibly do him any harm. It should be impossible to harm God. No harm, no crime. So failing to worship properly can't even be a crime, as there's nothing bad that can possibly even happen as a result. And so any punishment is disproportionate, unless you consider the punishment of victimless crimes to be a good thing. But is punishment loving towards those who receive the punishment? If there is a chance for them to learn and grow from it, then yes. If not, then it's just pure retribution, not love.
Scripture makes it clear that punishment is a show of love. Concerning spanking a child, for example, Proverbs 13, 24 says that he who loves his child does not spare the rod, but disciplines him because it's going to cause him to grow. Yup, that sure is one of the Bible verses that encourages child abuse. For decades now, it has been well documented that spanking has a negative effect on children's social development, emotional development, self-regulation, and cognitive development. And new research just published this past April shows that spanking a child alters their brain response in ways that are similar to what are conventionally seen as more traumatic forms of abuse, like sexual abuse. Spanking is linked to an increased chance of developing anxiety or depression. It makes it more difficult for children to engage positively in schools. Science has answered the question of whether or not spanking is an effective form of punishment, and the answer is a resounding and conclusive no. It is abusive. Also, the Bible doesn't say to spank them, it says to hit them with a rod. So we go from abuse to assault with a weapon. I imagine the side effects of that kind of punishment are best case scenario on par with spanking, but let's ignore all of that and look at what you're trying to say here. You are attempting to say that punishment is a way of showing love because it gives the child the opportunity to learn from their mistakes and do better in the future. Did those who died in the flood get that chance after the punishment was over? Or is the punishment still happening in hell for all of eternity with no chance of learning from their mistakes and no chance of improving in the future? It gives him wisdom, Proverbs 29, 15. Hebrews 12, 6 says that the Lord also chastens those he loves, since chastening causes us to grow, verses 10 and 11. Okay, so you're saying the flood victims do get a chance to learn and grow? It forces us to adjust our behavior in the future. Ultimately, it can save us from hell, Proverbs 23, 13, and 14. But don't all of the benefits that you just listed disappear if the punishment or chastening just sends them directly to hell with no chance of ever escaping? And even if that did somehow make sense, we're still left with the fact that God chose a very painful way to kill everyone, when he could have just blinked them all painlessly out of existence. Even if wiping out humanity was somehow justified, you can't say that God is loving because he chose one of the most cruel ways he could possibly have done it. Now, wait a minute. After a person is executed, like in the flood, he can't very well change his future behavior. He's dead. So even if it helps others, execution can't be for the purpose of saving him from hell. True. Okay, there we go. You agree. God was being unjust and cruel, therefore cannot be loving. And even if you somehow managed to say that he was, that love is not unconditional because execution for the failure to meet certain conditions is definitely conditional. But it's still loving of God to be fair and just to him, even when it means he receives punishment for something he's done. No. How did you get there? This whole video up till now has been you explaining that punishment is just and loving precisely because it comes with a chance to do better in the future. Using that to justify punishment means that, pretty much definitionally, if the punishment causes the receiver of that punishment to no longer have a chance to do better in the future, then it ceases to be just and loving. If God doesn't punish me for disobedience, but punishes others, how would that be fair? So what you're saying is that God's covenant with Noah in Genesis 8 was unjust? Because he admits while making the covenant that it didn't solve the problem. People are still evil right from the get-go. But he promises that despite people still being evil, he will never again kill everything on the planet because of it. So he punished the people who were alive in Noah's day, but did not punish the people who were just as bad after the flood. He has to be consistent. If punishment is a right and fair thing to implement, and we've already established that it is, then God can't pick and choose who he implements punishment on. Which is why he chose not to punish Noah when he punished the rest of the earth. Now, sure, it's totally believable that Noah, his wife, his three kids, and their wives were the only eight people on the entire planet that were behaving perfectly in accordance with God's will. That's definitely not God picking and choosing who he was going to punish and who he wouldn't. He has to have stated rules and punishments and then follow through with them, or he'd be guilty of showing partiality and playing favorites, which Scripture directly says he won't do. That's not loving. So then what's with that whole thing where the Israelites are God's chosen people? They are his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Is that not showing favoritism? 
He even says in Deuteronomy 7 verse 8 that the reason they are his favorites and he chose them to be his treasured people is because he loves them. The implication there being that he did not choose other people because he did not love them. I mean, it doesn't explicitly say that God doesn't love other people, but if you give because I love you as a reason for doing something for someone, the implication there is that you would not do that same thing for someone else, either because you don't love them, or at a minimum, you love them less. 1 Peter 1.17 says that God, without partiality, judges according to each one's work. So, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. Am I misinterpreting here, or does that verse basically just flat out say to do good deeds, not out of the goodness of your heart, but because you're scared of the punishment should you not do the good deeds? Execution isn't unfair and it isn't unloving. Eh, pretty much by definition, execution is unloving. I mean, in your worldview, I guess it could be loving if it meant the early termination of mortal suffering in order to enjoy an eternity of heaven, but that's not what you're claiming for the people who died in the flood now, is it? No, the painful death that God gave them in the flood was only the beginning of their eternal torment. Now, what would be unfair to the person being executed would be if God had laws that he expected us to follow, but didn't communicate them to us. So, kind of like the story of the Ten Commandments, where God has as of yet not communicated his law to the people, and he took so long giving it to Moses that the people who were waiting for him wondered what had happened. So, in an attempt to honor the God that brought them out of Egypt, that they did not yet know, they built an idol to worship it. And God got so mad at this idol worship that they didn't know was forbidden, that he wanted to kill all of them. But Moses talked him down to just having the Levites kill 3,000 of them. They broke a law they didn't know that they had, and were punished with only some of them being executed, while others got away with it. Aaron, whose idea it was to make the golden calf in the first place, not only survived this purge, but went on to become the high priest. The man whose crime was arguably the most egregious of the lot escaped punishment entirely. And of course, let's not forget that the flood took place before Moses brought the law down from the mountain, so at that point God had not communicated the law to anyone. And then he proceeded to execute us without our even knowing his expectations. Like he did for the 3,000 men, women, and children that the Levites killed. But that's not what God has done. The Bible disagrees. For the first 2,500 years of world history, God communicated his laws directly to humans, specifically to fathers, according to the book of Genesis. The people who drowned in the flood would have heard God's expectations, both directly from God and through prophets. Weird that he doesn't do that anymore. You'd think that would put this whole question of whether or not he exists to rest once and for all. Also, I notice how you keep pretty much habitually spewing out Bible verses that support whatever it is you're saying, but when you say that God directly gave his law to everyone, you just vaguely reference the entire book of Genesis. I don't remember that verse. Do you care to provide a citation for that one? Okay, so in a second, he does reference... 2 Peter 2, 5, Jude 14. ...as support for the idea that the people who drowned in the flood would have heard about God's expectations directly from God. They aren't the book of Genesis, but I found the citation of Jude 14 to be rather interesting, because in that passage, the author of Jude is, rather unambiguously, quoting the book of Enoch, an apocryphal book that people like Dr. Jeff here don't consider to be the inspired word of God. So, in order to support the idea that God revealed his law directly to people that he killed in the flood, he had to quote a New Testament epistle that was quoting a non-canonical text as though it were scripture, in order to avoid quoting that non-canonical text himself. What a weird little chain of custody. Starting around 1500 BC, God communicated to the Jews through Moses and the prophets, and in the New Testament he did so through Christ, the apostles, and prophets. What you seem to be saying here is that, as we get closer to well-documented modern history, God's communication gets less direct and starts to look the same as how the gods of all the other religions communicate to their followers. The scope almost seems to get narrower as time goes on. Pre-flood, God is communicating directly to everyone. Then, hypothetically at least, the people living on the American continents would have had a chance. Not so after the Flood, and God started communicating only with a tiny group of people in a small area of the world. Now everyone who doesn't live in that immediate vicinity is completely screwed. God being a fair God says that he will ensure anyone who wants to know his will will be able to find it. No, that's not fair. 
it should just be that everyone knows it by default. How do I know if I want to know what his will is, if I don't even know that he exists in the first place? Take cars, for instance. They are designed so that anyone who wants to know how to drive them will be able to figure it out without too much trouble. But something tells me that none of the Sentinelese people will decide one day, just out of the blue, that they want to learn how to drive a car. You know, on account of them being a mostly uncontacted tribe who are completely unaware of the existence of cars? They need to learn what cars are before they can even think about wanting to know how to drive one. They have to seek it, Matthew 7, 7 through 8. They have to hunger for it, Matthew 5, 6. But God guarantees that they'll be able to find the truth if they do those things. So just fuck all those people who have never been exposed to your God concept and so don't even know that God's law is something they should be seeking. Sadly, most people aren't really interested in doing God's will. It's their choice, Matthew 7, 13 and 14. And God can't be blamed for being a just judge and punishing them for their behavior in the way that he said he would. But he can be blamed for making that punishment wildly disproportionate to the crimes that he's supposedly punishing. He did decide what the punishment was, didn't he? Like, that was his thing? Or are you saying that there's some force beyond God that decides what the punishment needs to be? He won't force them to do what he wants them to do, obeying him and going to heaven. In fact, he won't even go out of his way to make sure they even know he exists and so have a chance of obeying and going to heaven. That wouldn't be fair or loving for him to do so. Well, since God is all-knowing, then when he makes all the babies, he knows where that baby will end up at the end of its life. So he could just choose not to make the ones that won't go to heaven, leaving free will intact, but not punishing people for all eternity. He has that ability. At least if he's all-powerful and all-knowing, he has that ability. And actually, this got me thinking. Does God make souls? Where do souls come from? Does he have control over which ones he makes and which ones he does not make? Because I could definitely see an argument being made that God doesn't actually directly make babies himself, because the only Bible verse that actually suggests something like that is actually talking specifically about King David, not about people in general. But then, where do these babies' souls come from? Would a baby not be born if God did not make a soul for it? Is the creation of the soul somehow tied to the creation of the baby, thereby taking it out of God's control? All right, whatever. One way or another, if the Christian God exists, he is responsible for all of the life that comes into the world, and he could choose not to make the life that will end up in hell, without removing free will from the life that will end up in heaven, simply by not making the hell-bound individuals. The act of making someone that he knows will end up in hell cannot be a loving act. He'd be a tyrant if he did. He'd also be a tyrant if he said, you must worship me or else be tortured for all eternity. So, he lets us choose to disobey him and go to hell if we so desire. No, that's not it. That's not how it works. I am not choosing to disobey him and desiring to go to hell. I am not convinced that he even exists in the first place, and so will not devote my time and money to worshipping a being that doesn't appear to exist. And if this being did exist, it appears to be malevolent. Even though it's not what he wants, 2 Peter 3, 9. If he doesn't want people to go to hell... He could just not send people to hell. That is possible. Well, I mean, if he's omnipotent, it's possible. Hell, even if disbelief must be punished, the whole point of punishment is to encourage good behavior in the future, is it not? Why is it too late to get into heaven after you die? Why can you not be punished in hell for a finite amount of time, and when you are sufficiently repentant, you get to move into heaven? There's this whole narrative in Christianity that after you die, it's too late to change your mind. But then they'll put on plays which show people changing their mind after dying, but being refused because it's too late. These are you it has to be there! It has to be there! No! I don't know! No! No! Well, why is it too late? The person who changes their mind after death is no longer choosing hell. They are being sent there against their will. So you can't blame the person who is going to hell for the fact that they are going to hell, even if living a life in sin or whatever is actually choosing hell, because changing your mind means that you are no longer choosing hell. And if we all live for eternity, then the point of death in the mortal realm seems like a rather arbitrary cutoff point. That was the choice of the wicked people who died in the flood. They were given two options. When Noah, the preacher of righteousness, 2 Peter 2, 5, preached to them, do the right thing, repent, and join Noah on the ark, or perish by the flood. 
Nothing in the Bible says that anyone was given that choice. You are implying that from the fact that 2 Peter 2, 5 refers to Noah as a herald of righteousness, but that title doesn't say that he was giving people an escape opportunity. It doesn't say that there was space available for them on the ark. It doesn't say that they can repent and be saved. It just says that Noah preached righteousness. You're reading something into that that you want to see there instead of just reading the text for what it is. They made their choice and God can't be blamed for their decision. They weren't the ones that decided to kill everything on the planet. That was God's decision, was it not? And one that he apparently regretted since he promised to not do it again, even though it didn't solve the problem that he wanted it to solve. But what about the innocent who died in the flood, like children? They can't be held accountable for the actions of their parents, can they? True, and the flood wouldn't have been punishment on them, but that's not the only purpose of death. And now we've reached the part of the video where he openly and clearly states that he approves of the killing of children because it gets them to heaven faster. Death is a blessing to those who are ready for eternity, Isaiah 57, 1 and 2. The righteous perishes and no man takes it to heart. Merciful men are taken away, while no one considers that the righteous is taken away from evil. He shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that you're in favor of bodily autonomy for women. You know, since it would be such a blessing for an aborted fetus to just skip all the bad parts of life, skip the potential for a hellbound existence, and just go straight to heaven? When a society decays to the point where virtually everyone is wicked, doing their own heart's desires, like the pre-flood world was doing, Genesis 6-5, children are the ones who tend to suffer most due to the behavior of their parents. And the best way to make sure that children don't suffer is to drown them, right? But really, if I grant this argument, then would a better method for God getting rid of all the wickedness not have been to inflict the world with some disease of some kind that kills you quickly and painlessly just before you stop being innocent and start being wicked? Is that beyond the scope of God's abilities? We need only look at abortion in our own society and the leading reasons for why mothers choose to have abortions to see that that's true. Did you not literally just say that dying as a child is a blessing because it ensures you a quick ticket into heaven? We need only look at the number of fatherless and orphan children today. We need only look at the drug and venereal disease epidemic among children today. There's a VD and drug epidemic among children? I hadn't heard that. But realistically, though, when looking at crime and safety statistics, right now is the best time to be alive in human history. I mean, just look at the descriptions of heaven in ancient holy books. The Bible tells us it's a city made of gold, which is wildly impractical, but ignoring that, the best they could think of is for everyone to have access to a pretty shiny rock. There's not much description of heaven in the Bible apart from that, but we can also look to other holy books to see what people thought of as paradise back then. The Quran tells us that paradise will have rivers of water, wine, milk, and honey always fresh. And couches. There will be comfy couches, too. Now, what makes this paradise? Is it the fact that your milk is in a river? No, that sounds gross. It's the fact that you always have access to fresh milk whenever you want. Same for wine, water, and honey. Always right there, at your beck and call, while you sit on a big comfy couch. There are people today who live in poverty, who have lives that are so good that they are better than the best paradise that could be imagined when Muhammad was dictating the Quran. I'm sitting in a comfy chair right now. I actually stand up to record. I was sitting when I wrote that. It has cushions all over it, and it's a bit cold, so I'm wrapped up in a cozy, fuzzy blanket wearing a cozy, thick, warm hoodie. And there's fresh milk, water, honey, and wine all in my house right now that I could have any time that I want. My kids are more safe wandering the streets than I was when I was a kid. And on top of that, we have systems in place that will bring attention to any problems that might arise much earlier than when I was a kid. If one of my kids doesn't make it to school and I haven't reported them as absent for a known reason, then I get an automated email from the school letting me know that my kid was marked as absent so I can immediately take action if necessary. My daughter has a cell phone whose location I can track at any time. Just checked, she's at school. No surprise there. We have vaccines against diseases that were commonplace and incredibly deadly just a century ago. We have medical technology that allows us to treat diseases that the authors of the Bible weren't even aware of. We flew a motherfucking probe through the corona of the goddamn sun. I know apologists love the doom and gloom narrative about how bad the times are because they kind of need that to be true in order for their book to be true, but the fact of the matter is that it's not true. Children in immoral societies suffer 
physically, they suffer psychologically, and they suffer spiritually, being reared to behave as wickedly as their parents and society around them. I hope my kids are a bit more wicked than I was, actually. Just don't tell them that I said that. It can sometimes be a great show of mercy for God to take them out of such a situation where they can enter into eternity while still in an innocent state. As the giver of life, Acts 17, 25, only he is authorized to make such decisions. Just because you gave something does not give you the authority to take that thing away. If I give someone my car, I don't get to come back to them in a year and say, hey, yeah, well, because I gave that to you, only I am authorized to decide when you no longer have it. So give it back to me now, because that's not how giving works. Only God is in a position to know when it would be best to take such a life since he's all-knowing. He knows the future and knows, for example, how an individual will affect all of those around him in his life for good or evil. And so since he has this knowledge, he could just choose not to make those that will affect those around them for evil and only make those who will affect those around them for good, thereby completely eliminating evil while preserving free will. Why doesn't he do that? Bottom line, God is not unloving for destroying the world in the flood. In fact, when we understand what agape love means in the Bible, it could be argued that he would have been unloving not to destroy the world in the flood. War is peace, freedom is slavery, genocide is love. Got it. That's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Andy Zartman, who says, Is high genetic load the dirtiest thing ever said on this channel? Not likely. It actually seems kind of tame for my sense of humor. Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, iOS Tilt Bill Gamer, Bryn Pound, Clench Eastwood, Lynn Dobbs, Mark McManus, Mark Hetchum, and all the rest, who are the motherfucking probe that we flew into the goddamn corona that is my channel. If you'd like to be really hot and fast, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. If you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wishlist. Links to social media, all the ways to support the channel and to my other projects can be found at links.vicerhino.com. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my P.O. Box address is in the description. See you next time.